Regular season is upon us here on Building the Franchise with the New England Patriots. We have a lot of information to cover here on this episode. We're going to go through all the first eight weeks of the regular season. Now that we're past the preseason and we're into the games that count, there's not as many administrative things that need to be covered, but rest assured there's still some stuff that we're going to need to cover here on episode three. We start out in week one against the Cardinals, a very tough team throughout the preseason who went undefeated without allowing more than 16 points through any of their games. This Cardinals defense was dominant all throughout preseason, helping the team win by an average of 12 points against the Raiders, Chargers, Texans, and Broncos. And even though it was only preseason, with a four-game win streak against AFC teams, you know the Cardinals, with us going into their stadium, are going to be looking to make an early statement on the season, proving that they're a contender and they may very well be in the playoffs this season. For our game plan this week, we're going to work, focus on the flood concept on offense and cover four on defense, with our focus players being Malcolm Mitchell, Cyrus Jones, and Jonathan Jones. Jones. It's a fresh start throughout the league here in week one as these two teams have high hopes for the season ahead. It's the Patriots going up against the Cardinals. One thing that we did not expect here against the Cardinals was David Johnson's ability to break tackles. He only had 47 yards on the day, but he did have five broken tackles that were in very crucial situations throughout the game, which helped keep the Cardinals on the field on two very important drives, and he ended up capping off both of these drives with a touchdown. The Cardinals were able to get a lot of pressure on Tom Brady. They sacked him four times, and he only threw 121 yards, no touchdowns, and two interceptions. The only real highlights that the Patriots had in this game was a 62-yard touchdown out of the Wildcat formation by James White and an interception by Devin McCourty and Logan Ryan. We couldn't get past the tough Arizona defense here in Week 1, and we fall 21-7 in the season opener. Here in Week 2, we're going to be going against our first division opponent of the season, the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins lost in Week 1 against the always tough Seattle team, 7-14, with Sherman having two interceptions against them. We're going to be looking to continue the woes for the Miami Dolphins quarterbacks and hopefully pick them off at least two times again. But in order to do that, we have a big issue we have to fix first. We lost two starting corners in the loss to Arizona, and we worked out a deal here with the Minnesota Vikings. We're going to bring in Captain Munderland and we're going to send the Vikings a 2017 fifth round pick and a 2018 third round pick. As a sweetener for the trade, we're going to get back a 2017 fourth round pick with Munderland from the Vikings. So hopefully Munderland will be able to fill the shoes of the, at least one of the guys that we lost in the first game. So we'll be able to actually have somewhat of a secondary. The three players we're going to focus on this week against the Miami Dolphins for our game plan are going to be rookie cornerback Cyrus Jones, the free agent acquisition Kyle Friend, and the young right outside linebacker Markevious Mingo. On the offensive side of the ball, we're going to work on running the inside zone and cover three on defense. With the recent success in Super Bowls of the Patriots since the early 2000s, it's probably hard to believe, but Miami actually leads the all-time series against New England by four wins in the regular and postseason. We came into this game really wanting to establish the run game to take some pressure off Tom Brady and hopefully avoid some of those sacks we had in the first game against the Cardinals. And Deion Lewis and LeGarrette Blunt done just that. With 120 combined yards and Blunt getting into the end zone three times, it really helped Brady have a much better game than in week one. Brady had one touchdown for, with 148 yards, he didn't throw any interceptions, and he found Edelman three times for 84 yards and a touchdown. The time that we spent on Barkevious Mingo during practice this week really ended up paying off. He sacked Tannehill two times in this game and really helped you know, keep him off balance throughout the game. With Jonathan Jones and Deron Harmon both getting an interception in this game, it brings the Patriots' total interceptions on defense to four, and Deron Harmon actually got back into the end zone on his interception, brought that back for a touchdown for the first pick six for the Patriots defense. Plays like this are exactly what we were talking about in episode one of the series. The Patriots defense has a lot of potential, and even though they're young, they can change games with just one play. The Patriots hold on to the win, 38-26 in the first division matchup. In week three, we're up against a 0-2 Houston Texans team who are coming off of losses to the Bears and the Chiefs. Just because the Houston Texans are winless so far on the season, that doesn't mean we're going to overlook them or think that they're going to be an easy team to beat. The Texans have a great front seven, especially there on their defensive line. And with the middle of our offensive line being a struggle so far in the season, it's going to be a challenge to see if we can keep Tom Brady upright and see if he can go through his progressions without being hurried. Also here in week three, we have our first opportunity to re-sign some of the players whose contracts are ending this season. 
The only two players that we're able to make offers to currently are Jamie Collins and Jabal Sheard. Overall, our almost our entire defense, especially you know most of the veterans, are guys that we're going to have to try to re-sign. Names like Donta Hightower, Logan Ryan, and the Super Bowl hero against the Seahawks, Malcolm Butler. Most of these guys are considered staples on the Patriots defense. And a lot of these younger guys we're definitely going to want to try to keep around like Jamie Collins and Malcolm Butler, those are two guys that we really can't let go. We have to keep them really almost no matter what the cost. First things first, we're going to offer Jamie Collins $84.5 million over six years, and he's going to accept. So Jamie Collins is not leaving New England. He's going to be here most likely for the duration of this Madden, and that is a huge player for us to be able to keep. He's the captain of the defense, and he's definitely a guy who, you know, he's young, but he still knows what he's doing. He knows how to make plays. He knows how to be where he needs to be at the right time. So he's definitely a huge player that I'm glad we got to keep. The only other guy we're currently able to make an offer to to extend his contract is going to be Jabal Shear. And just like Jamie Collins, he's a huge player. He's a huge name on our defense. And he's somebody who you know, causes issues for the opposing quarterbacks almost every single down. And we're going to go ahead and offer Shear a four-year, $36.8 million extension. And it looks like he, you know, he wants a little more bonus money. He wants a little more guaranteed money. So next week we're going to have to try to see if we can adjust it and see if we can keep him around long term. Game planning this week, we're going to work on the outside runs, outside zone runs, and cover two defense. We're also going to work on Malcolm Mitchell, DeAndre White, and Kyle Friend. We head towards kickoff. Two quarterbacks will be on the field today trying to push their teams to victory. It's Osweiler's Texans going up against Brady's Patriots. The ball hawking ways of the Patriots secondary continue against the Texans as Collins, Chung, and Harmon all record an interception. However, exactly what we were trying to avoid and what we feared you know, while we were game planning this week ended up happening. The Texans, including Clowney and Watt, ended up controlling the trenches on us. And they got to Brady three times. They got three sacks. Um, they hurried him a lot. He ended up throwing two interceptions, but he countered that a little bit with two touchdown passes to Rob Gronkowski, uh, Gronk's first two touchdowns of the season. Hopkins seemed to have the Patriots secondary's number all game. He ended up with three receptions for 103 yards. We kept him out of the end zone though, which is you know definitely a plus. And despite an attempt at a fourth quarter comeback, we ended up falling to the Texans 23 to 17. Moving on to week number four, we have a tough division matchup again for the second time in four weeks against the Buffalo Bills. The Bills are sitting at two and one so far on the season, coming fresh off of a win against the Cardinals where they only allowed one sack. And if you'll remember from our week one matchup, the Cardinals got to us four times. So that's something that, you know, definitely definitely they have a better offensive line than us. So hopefully we can break through and, you know, get some pressure on the quarterback, make him make some mistakes. But before we hop over into the game plan and into the game, we have some contract negotiations we need to take care of. We have some adjustments we need to make with Jabal Sheard, you know, hopefully to get him to sign. And then we have two other players who are ready to negotiate as well. Before we do that, though, the training staff has come to us and let us know that Eric Rowe is available to play. He's been cleared, but at the same time, it's going to drop his injury rating from 86 to 73, stamina from 92 to 78, and strength from 71 to 60. The trade for Captain Munderland from the Vikings was really what we were this is what we needed it for. This is the reason we went through with that trade. We don't want to put our guys back in there too early and risk a re-injury or something that's going to take them out for the rest of the season. So we're going to let him sit on the bench. We're going to continue to let Jonathan Jones and Captain Munderland take the place. The first player we're going to bring into the coach's office is going to be Dante Hightower. He's a 26-year-old middle linebacker. He's, again, another staple of defense. He's somebody he, you know, we'd like to keep around. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to offer him. 33.8 million for four years and once again he wants more money up front he wants more you know guaranteed money so again we're gonna have to wait another week on Hightower so now we're gonna head over to Sheard and we're gonna increase his offer from 36.4 million for four years to 39.8 let's see if he's willing to take that and once again the bonus is still the issue so we're gonna have to work on that again next week as well and that's something that you know EA really worked on this year it, it seems um, Last year, you could get away with almost no bonus, very little bonus for a lot of players, uh, no matter how big of names they were. Sometimes the bigger names would require a, a lot more bonus, but this year, I'm not having any luck with it. Um, a lot of these players are definitely wanting their money. They're wanting to see the money up front. They're wanting to know that they're guaranteed a big payout. The last player that we're going to get a chance to re-sign this week is going to be Martellus Bennett. We're going to offer him 34.8 million over five years. And once again, the bonus is the issue. So we may try that again next week, but at the same time, I'm not 100% sure that I want to bring him back for next season. 
He's an older player who's going to start to regress, and we still have Gronkowski on a long-term deal. So it might not be a bad thing to bring in a young, talented tight end to compliment Gronkowski. For our game plan this week against the Buffalo Bills, we're going to work on DeAndre White, Malcolm Butler, and Kyle Friend. We're also going to work on countering against the Blitz and cover two man. Once again, the Patriots secondary comes up big in this game. McCourty has three interceptions. Hightower, Roberts, and Jonathan Jones all get one for a total of six interceptions on the day. The last of McCourty's interceptions comes in the form of a 94-yard touchdown off of a tipped pass right near the end zone. The Bills were looking to score, and McCourty was having none of it. McCourty was definitely the player of the game for this game, but right there behind him was Deion Lewis, who carried the ball nine times for 89 yards and a touchdown. He also had two receptions for 75 yards and a touchdown. The touchdown came off a 67-yard lob over the top. He beat the linebacker and was home free. Another good takeaway from this game is Brady did not get sacked at all. He did throw three interceptions, but a lot of those were just poor decisions, but he actually stayed upright. He never got sacked, so it's a huge, huge kudos to the offensive line that's been struggling lately. Due in large part to the defensive play of this game, the Patriots improved to 2-2 on the season with a 28-10 win over the Bills. We're also 2-0 in the division and looking to get another win next week against the Browns. Hello Week 5 and hello 1-3 Cleveland Browns. The Browns are coming into this game with their only win on the season being against the Miami Dolphins 30-13 in Week 3. Back to our contract negotiations and back to try to get Jabal Sheard to sign for the third week in a row. Once again, we're going to improve the signing bonus. We're going to bring the total contract up to 42.6 over four years, and he still wants more signing money. At this point, it, it honestly doesn't look like Sheard is being a team player at all. He wants nothing but money for, in his pocket. He doesn't care about helping other players on the team get their contract signed. He doesn't care about any of that. He apparently doesn't even care where he plays. His only concern at this time is just having money in his pocket to take home at the end of the day. Moving on to try to get Hightower to sign, we're going to increase the bonus a little bit. We're going to bring the bonus up to $2 million, making the offer 33.9. And looks like Hightower is wanting to leave New England. He's wanting to test out free agency and see if he can get some more money somewhere else. And as I'm sure most of you know, just because Hightower says he wants to test out free agency doesn't necessarily mean he's going to get the chance. We still have our franchise tag as a team, so we may use that on him. There's really nobody else I can think of at this time that we could use it on or would use it on. So that could be a possibility going into the offseason. We'll just have to see how that plays out. And we're going to go ahead and move on to our number one corner, Malcolm Butler. This is a guy we definitely do not want to leave New England. He's still really young. He's got quick development, and he's definitely the star of the secondary. We're going to start out his contract negotiation at $38.7 million over four years. And it appears that he doesn't like the bonus or the duration, so we're going to have to see what we can do about that next week. He's, like I said, he's definitely a player we want to keep around, so we want to get him locked in as soon as possible. There are only two other players left that we can try to sign for this week, Martellus Bennett and Rob Ninkovich. Martellus Bennett we are actually not going to submit an offer to this week. We're going to give it a little bit, maybe a week or two, and try to see maybe if that's the direction we really want to go. We do, however, end up submitting an offer to Rob Ninkovich, the 32-year-old outside linebacker. We submit an offer to him for $15 million over two years, and he ends up accepting. We've got two teams who are looking to find a way to win. It's the Browns coming in at 1-3, and three, going up against the Patriots, who come in at 2-2. Two and two. As you can see here coming down to the end of this game, we are in a tough battle against the Browns. The video you're going to see here is going to be of the last two minutes of the game, so sit back and enjoy. With a huge interception by Butler on the Browns' final drive when they're trying to basically just kill the clock, we end up winning the game 22-21 to in that nail-biter. Here in week number 6, we're going to be up against an extremely tough 3-2 Bengals team. 
These Bengals are coming off a devastating 42-14 loss to Dallas, and I'm sure they're going to be looking to avenge that in the game against us. For our game plan for this week, we're going to continue to focus on countering the blitz as well as the cover two defense. And our focus players are going to be Kyle Friend, Cyrus Jones, and Malcolm Mitchell. Heading back over to try to re-sign some of the players that we still need to re-sign, we're going to give the same offer as last week to Malcolm Butler, $38.7 million for four years. And his issue this time is that he doesn't like the salary, so we're going to have to try that again next week and see if we can get something worked out and get the paper signed to get everything over with so that he's there in New England long term. Back to the stingy Jabal Sheard, we're going to increase his offer from 42.6 to 46.8 over four years, and hopefully he'll actually take that. I know he's being a little stingy, but we're hoping that we can get him back in New England for next season and keep him as a force on the defensive line. Sheard's been called into the front office, and just like that, he agrees to the contract. He is going to be in New England next season and for the next four seasons. Hopefully he'll be able to continue the success he's had on the defensive line and help us continue to win games. There are still three other players that we can try to re-sign, Martellus Bennett, James Devlin, and Logan Ryan. We're going to hold off on them. We're not going to make any offers to any of these guys yet. We're going to wait a week and see what we, you know, how, how everything plays out, see who we want to continue to try to go after. I know Logan Ryan will be one that we will go after, just not right now. Unfortunately, there are no highlights and no game film from this week six matchup against the Bengals. However, we, you know, we did end up losing this one. We fell to the Bengals 23-21 to in a very close match. And we are locked in an extremely close race in the AFC East. The Patriots, the Jets, and the Bills are all sitting at 3-3 three and three, with the Dolphins only at 1-5. and five. In week number 7, we go on the road. We travel to Pittsburgh to take on the 6-0 and o Pittsburgh Steelers. The Steelers, they've started off really fast this season, and we're going to have to do everything we can throughout this entire game to knock them off this pedestal that they put themselves on. With this battle for the lead in the AFC East being such a tight race right now, every single game is extremely important, no matter who the opponent is, but especially if it's a team that's, you know, the number one seed in the conference right now. For yet another week in a row, we're going to bring Malcolm Butler into the Patriots front office and try to get some deal worked out with him. We're going to increase his offer from 38.7 to 38.9 million over four years. Hopefully he'll accept this. Let's see what he says. So it seems like we figured out what kind of salary he wants, but we're still a little bit off on the bonus, so we're going to have to revisit that next week. And I, I really feel like we're running out of time with this guy. He's a, Like I said, he's a player who we really want to keep, so we may have to you know, go a little higher than what we actually want to pay for him just to keep him in New England and keep him you know, the strong point of the secondary. The only other key offers and decisions that were made this week, we made an offer to Martellus Bennett for five years, and he turned it down and decided he wanted to test free agency. We made an initial offer to Logan Ryan, who wants more bonus money than what we offered. And we made our first offer to Le LeGarrette Blunt as well. And he didn't like anything about the offer, so he's another guy that we're going to have to decide. He's getting a little older. We're going to have to decide if we want to spend a little bit of money on him or let him walk. For our game plan against the Steelers, we're going to keep the same three focus players and work on situational red zone defense and shallow cross offense. The, field, the Steelers are top ten in converting third down opportunities, and they'll be up against the Patriots defense. And just like in week five against the Browns, we have a game coming down to the last two minutes. We currently have a five-point lead against the undefeated Pittsburgh Steelers, so let's see if we can hold on and get the win against this team. We couldn't get in the end zone from the one yard line unfortunately, so we end up taking the undefeated Steelers to overtime where they intercept the ball from us on our first possession and kick the field goal to win the game against the Patriots 27-24. to 
The last week that we're going to be covering here on this episode is going to be the Week 8 matchup against the Buffalo Bills, who if you remember, we kind of embarrassed in Week 4. We picked him off six times, so hopefully we can continue that success and you know keep it staying in his head and make him make mistakes and come away with the win. Right now, the Bills have a 4-3 and three record. We're sitting at 3-4, and four, so we definitely need to beat them to at least tie up the top of the division. For our game plan for this week against the Bills, we go with the exact same game plan we used the last time we played them. I'm pretty sure that seems to be what worked, so we're going to continue that. For our signings for this week, we did end up signing Malcolm Butler to a four-year $39.9 million contract, as well as Logan Ryan. We signed, signed Logan Ryan to the exact same contract as Malcolm Butler, so those two guys are going to be in New England for the next four years, being a, wreaking havoc on opposing quarterbacks. For LeGarrette Blunt, we ended up increasing his offer just a little bit, and the same thing as last week, he wants more bonus money. We do, however, get Barkevious Mingo to sign a six-year contract extension, so Mingo is going to be in New England for six more years with Jamie Collins. Hello, everybody. I'm Larry Ridley. You're tuned into the NFL on EA Sports. One team comes in off a of victory. The other comes in off a of defeat. So let's send you up to Orchard Park, New York. And on their first possession of the game, the Bills drive down the field and they kick a field goal from the 31, bouncing it off the left upright. It's going to be Patriots ball. After being stuffed two times trying to run on first and second down, we throw the play action pass and Preston Brown, middle linebacker for the Bills, makes a crazy acrobatic interception to take the ball back for the Buffalo Bills. The Bills drive down the field. They're sitting on our four-yard line, first and goal. Tyrod Taylor drops back, the ball is tipped, and the high tower makes the interception, crazy diving interception at the one yard line to stop the Bills in their tracks. After the interception was such poor field position, we were unable to really get the ball down the field. Tyrod Taylor drops back, he throws it down the middle into double coverage and is picked off by the rookie Cyrus Jones for Tyrod Taylor's second interception for the game. In field goal range, facing a third and ten, we're going to just hand the ball off to the right side of Garrett Blunt, who runs over a tackler and shows exactly why he wants that extra bonus one. Once again, unable to do anything on first or second down, Tom Brady drops back from the ten on third and six and hits Chris Hogan in the end zone to put the Patriots ahead, seven to zero going into halftime. Driving down the field on the opening possession of the second half, Tom Brady hits a play action bomb to Malcolm Mitchell on the right side, touchdown New England, 14 to zero. After stalling once again in the red zone due to dropped passes and penalties, the Bills are forced to kick a field goal just to get some points on the board, 14-3 New England. After back-to-back -back three and outs by both teams, Brady hits Hogan on the right side. He hits him on a perfectly set up screen and he's headed for the end zone, but he stopped just short. He stopped at the one yard line on a play that probably would have sealed the game for New England. Three plays later, Tom Brady finds a wide open Martellus Bennett in the end zone for a Patriots touchdown to increase the lead to 21-3. With two minutes left in the game, still not giving up hope, Taylor finds Roddy White for White's first touchdown of the season from the three-yard line. The Bills close the gap just a little bit, 21-10, with one minute and 58 seconds left in the game. After some poor clock management there at the end of the game, the Bills end up scoring again but missing the two-point conversion, making the final score 24-16 New England. And with the last second field goal to beat the Browns, the Jets take sole possession, one game lead in the AFC East, while we sit at 4-4 four four heading into our bye week. And that's going to do it for episode number three of building the franchise with the New England Patriots. Be sure to check out all the NBL live games, especially week 10 when the Patriots take on the Seahawks. Also, be sure to check out the Commissioner's Corner podcast with Bomber and Lip and the brand new series, the NBO Blitz podcast with Brocco. And as always, make sure you leave some comments. Let me know if there's any kind of adjustments or anything you want to see more or less of in the show. And I'll see you guys soon with episode number four.